Hey, good morning, church. Let's stand and let's get started this morning.
we offer ourselves this morning to you. We stand in awe of your goodness, of your mercy, Lord. This morning in Sunday school, we talked about how your word is always showing us new things. And the more we learn about the history, the time, and the context of when your word was written, we learn so many things that we've not seen before. I thank you, God, that you are so patient with us. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, you are such a good teacher. Would you come teach us this morning. Father, would you be glorified and honored by our worship today? Amen.
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. You can take your seats while the ushers come forward. You may all be seated. All right, just a couple of announcements for you guys. Good morning. The snow started when most of you were on your way, so good job making it here safely. We haven't had much practice driving in the snow this year, so hopefully you're all doing well out there. Um, uh, reminder, right after the service this morning is going to be the special congregational meeting. Uh, the church board and others have made some adjustments to the church constitution as far as 
uh, adding a couple doctrines and then just some other nuts and bolts. So we hope that uh, members especially, uh, all are welcome, so please just uh, plan to stay after. There is going to be a fire drill during this, so put a hat on. It's going to be great. And we're appreciative of our safety team taking care of us, right? Thank you. All righty. That's all I have for you. Tracy, come on up. Tracy has a uh, mission presentation she'd like to give, so I'm going to turn it over to her. Good morning, everyone. I say good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm here, I'm here to talk, to talk about, about Overland Missions. Um, as, you as you know, I am I going am on a mission trip to Zambia, Zambia Africa, Africa in, in July. July. Um, um, so, so I just, I just wanted, wanted to, to um, just talk to you guys about it, and hopefully that you guys, uh, first of all, I'm asking for prayer, um, that you would pray that God will use the team that I'm going with. It's not through this church, but it's through Overland Missions. And then I'll possibly, if God would touch your heart, that you would financially support me. But I wanted to give you... Um, just a background on why I'm going on this mission trip. So I want to tell you a story about the reason why I moved to Northern Michigan. Um, so I was called to Northern Michigan back on, um, in 2021. Um, I lost my job downstate and um, God called me here to take a job at the Bay Harbor Yacht Club. But before I left to come here, God said to go feed my people. Didn't know who those people were, but I knew I was feeding somebody. <clears throat> so I thought those were the people I was supposed to be feeding, but that's not who we meant. Um, so I've been, um, so the, the day that I moved here, which was uh, March the 28th, and so March the 29th, I got in my car, and I was on my way to Myers, and I asked God, I said, Lord, I need a church family. I need a home where I could be able to go to express myself like like-minded people. And so I went to Myers and I was doing my grocery shopping, and I met a young lady there. Her name is Julie. And uh, she comes here sometimes periodically through home group. And so we were just talking, and she just was giving me compliments about my hair and all these other things. And we just started talking about how good God is. And through that, I told her, I said, well, you know, I'm looking for a church, and I want to be able to go to a church that will be able to accept me for who I am. And so she sent me here. And I said, okay, so she sent me here, but I didn't know that she had called ahead <laughs> to warn <laughs> Pastor Mark about me. So I walked into church, and the first person that greeted me was Miss Sonia Elder. And she gave me the biggest hug with the most beautiful smile, and I felt welcome. But what was the icing on the cake was when Pastor Mark walked up to me and said, welcome and we are so glad that you are here. And for me, that was more than anything. That meant more to me than anything. And I knew I was in the right place. So I began to go to work. And what that meant for me is I began to volunteer to do whatever I could do to help God's people. Um, so I just began to work with Shannon and Kimball a little bit here and there. And then I worked. Um, I went on three mission trips through, throughout the church. And I urge anyone that has not been on a mission trip to go. It does not just do more for them, but it does so much for you. It takes you out of, first of all, of your comfort zone, and it just expands you on seeing what God can do through you to help others. And that's what I'm here for. And God gave me a special gift to be able to cook. So why wouldn't I be able to use that gift to feed his people? So yesterday on my truck, I not yesterday, Friday, I had a young man that came to the truck, my food truck, and he said, um, I said, good morning, and he was, we spoke, and we had a conversation. And he said, you know, I, told, I was told to come here and get a sausage breakfast sandwich. And I said, okay. So I said, let's make it. And he said, but I was told that because the guy that came here had the breakfast sandwich said that it was so good that it made him want to cry. And I started laughing. But after I made the sandwich and then he left, I began to weep because I knew that that was God using me to spread the love of Christ through the food to other people. And now I've grained not only just a customer, but a friend, someone that wants to hear and wants to know who God is. That's what we're here for. That's what I'm here for, is to spread the good news. And so I just ask that you would, you know, just help me out if you could. But prayer first, prayer before anything. So I just want to go over a couple things that, that I've learned. 
is overlay missions and who they are is Overland Missions exists to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the most remote people in the most forgotten places on earth. We are pioneers. We fly, we drive, boat, or walk to the furthest corners. We are evangelists. We minister by personally sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and administering the power of the Holy Spirit through miracles, signs, and wonders. We are pastors and teachers. We disciple by instilling the power of the new creation life until the gospel has reached its full effect and a culture has been transferred. We develop teams and indigenous leaders and create a sustainable viral move of God. Now, who wouldn't want to be a part of that, to be able to reach people that would never get a chance to be able to hear the gospel of Christ, that would never be able to know who Jesus is and have never been able to just be able to come across a person like me and I'll be able to come across a person like that. I can learn so much from them, not just from what they are and who they are, but what they do. I mean, to be able to go there and, and, and watch them cook would be uh, amazing for me, to be able to stand beside them and watch them cook. So they have built this new, um, this new facility here, I believe it's called, It's called, uh, they have a base over in Zambia, and it's called Rapid 13. So they built this huge place for kings and queens to come to be able to worship and praise God, and then to be able to go out and to spread the gospel also to all of the villages there. And then they also have a um, kids ministry that's called Kids on Fire. And how awesome is that where the kids are going out ministering to other kids? And this is something that I am truly, truly knowing that God has called me to do. And I just wanted to show you a couple pictures. I've never been there before. I've never even been with this group. But I did go and research them. And when I went to... given us when we were there at the And I think the last slide is just a video. These are the kids on fire right here. Just look at that. That's so amazing. And then I have a video at the end. So this is their revival week. And every time, every, every year they have a revival week where they just study and worship and pray the Lord all day long. They only take breaks to eat and go to sleep. So they're so committed to, to doing what God wants to do. I want to talk uh, later on today if you want to come up. I have letters that you can
Thank you, Tracy. And you're more of a blessing than just food, Tracy. More than just food. Uh, Ken, come on up, please. We have Ken's going to share a few uh, words about the Christian Education Freedom Forum. Uh, really quick, uh, feel led to give to Tracy's uh, to support her. She'll be available after the service, okay? Uh, Ken. Hi, thanks, Matt. Um, so how many of you in this room um, either have been homeschooled or you are planning on homeschooling or you have your kids or grandchildren um, are in a parochial private school? Probably a fair amount of us in here, right? Probably more than half. So this might be of interest to you. This Wednesday, um, we're going to have Mr. Israel Wayne from Family Renewal come here and tell us a little bit about some legislation that's pending that could drastically affect um, our ability to educate our children um, freely as we have ever since our state's inception in 1837. We've never had to have um, our children in the private arena, including homeschooling, be registered. The only ones that are registered are the ones that the state's funded. And now there's a change for that, all in the name of making things safer for children. So um, if you have the ability to be here by, at 10 o'clock on Wednesday or want to pass this information on to somebody who might be here, we're going to have a forum here at that time. And Israel's going to answer questions. He's going to inform us about what's happening there behind the curtain. Otherwise, something like this might go under the radar. I have some flyers here that I could pass out to anybody who's interested in just kind of a reminder. Anybody would like one? Thank you. All right, thank you, Ken. Uh, we're going to have our little ones go down to nursery now. And um, so follow them down. And the rest of you, if you'll open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 28. So Acts 28. How many have already been blessed this Sunday? And just what a joy to be here. I feel like we're just... Have uh, just God's done so much already in our time together and worship and hearing a mission report and just seeing how God's on the move in our hearts and our families and our community. Uh, we have a few more minutes here. We want to dive into the word and see uh, what God has for us from the scriptures and that faith would come through hearing, hearing the word proclaimed and apply them to our lives for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ. So, Father, we pray as your word is being shared here this morning uh, that we would have hearts to just to know and to understand what you are saying, that we'd have ears to listen, we'd have eyes to see, and Lord, that we would um, have a, a greater sense of uh, what it means to follow your son, Jesus Christ. Uh, help us in this time, Lord. We know that uh, apart from you, we can do nothing, but with you, that all things are possible. So, Lord, let our faith grow in terms of uh, how you are moving in our hearts and our lives and how you are calling us, Lord, to just a, a closer walk with you. We pray that we would be faithful in these things. Thank you, Lord, that you are faithful all the time. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, last week, we looked at the shipwreck. And if you remember that, Paul in a shipwreck. He had 276 companions on the ship, heading for Rome for a fair trial. On the way, shipwrecked. Then he's uh, landed on the island of Malta. What happened on Malta? Bit by a snake, right? And then he shook off the snake, and they thought, well, he's a murderer, he's, he's bit by a snake, and then uh, God healed him from that, and he said, well, he must be a god. And so he's on the island of Malta, and it's an opportunity in the difficulty, and that's what we looked at last week, is that the difficulties, the challenges that we go through in life, that those are uh, really opportunities that we have in a way to be able to grow closer to Jesus, to share the gospel, and that God is 
uh, working all things for good for his purposes for those who love him. And so uh, we're going to pick it back up here in Acts 28 and what happened after uh, his time in the island of Malta. Now, Paul was on his way to see Rome. Has anybody ever been to Rome here before? So there's a, all right, one of you has. Awesome, Jama. So there's a scripture that Paul shared in Romans 19, 21. He said, I must see Rome. I could agree with that scripture. I said, I must see Rome too. I'd love to go to Rome someday. But in this day, uh, Paul's day, Seneca, the historian, said that Rome was a cesspool of iniquity. And so why would Paul want to go to Rome? in that day. And when we look at it, where it's the darkest, then that's where the light of Jesus shines the brightest, isn't it? And we're to be like stars shining in the darkness. And Paul understood Rome is a, was a dark place, and he must go to Rome. He believed that, that God was calling him there. We know the phrase says that all roads lead to where? Rome, Rome right? If all roads re, uh, go to Rome, lead to Rome, then they all lead from Rome as well, right? And so that's the goal, is as Paul is going to Rome and sharing the gospel, then all the roads lead out of Rome in a way that the gospel will be carried to all the nations. And so Paul was very strategic in the gospel going to Rome so that it would flow around the world. And the reason really we got the gospel to the uttermost is because Paul got it to Rome, and from Rome it spread out everywhere. And so Paul is on his way to Rome. Today we're going to look at Paul's time in Rome. So let's pick it up. Verse 11, and we'll uh, pick it up after the shipwreck and his time on Malta. Verse 11 says, after three months on Malta there, we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria with twin gods as a figurehead. Putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. So we're going to follow on this map a little bit and just kind of see where Paul went. These are real places. We know where he was and where he was uh, heading as well. And Matt, if we can get that uh, map up there. So you see Malta at the, uh, at the island on the bottom. Then you, they sailed north to Syracuse. You can see that in verse 12. And then over to Regium. And then um, heading up north through there, we see that in verse 13. Um, one day after one day, a south wind sprang up. And the second day, we came to Puteoli. And so now they're heading up the coast of Italy. Verse 14. We found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days, and so we came to Rome. And so you can see the journey that Paul took coming uh, to Rome, and we see then that he is arriving in Rome. Verse uh, 15 says, and when the brothers were there, they heard about us and came as far as the form of Appius and three taverns to meet us. And I want to just uh, pause here for a moment. Paul's on his way to Rome as we've Shared here, and if you go back to that map just for a moment, and looking at where Paul was and how he got there, there's a, if we can go to the zoomed in top part of Italy right there. So you see Rome at the very top, you see three taverns, and the form of Appius. So the form of Appius is about 30 miles away, three taverns is about 12 miles away. As he's on this journey, the friends are coming out to meet him. So there's already uh, disciples of Jesus Christ that are in these areas. And Paul, they hear that Paul's on the way, and so they go out to meet him. And that word meet is a really uh, powerful word. But um, these are friends of Paul's, or at least they become friends of Paul's. And there's a phrase that says, in prosperity our friends know us, in adversity we know our friends. I'll say that one more time. In prosperity our friends know us, in adversity we know our friends. But Paul's in adversity, and this is something that, that cannot be overlooked is this act of friendship with these friends coming out to meet him in his adversity. There's a court in Florida that recently made a decision on the legal definition of friendship. Did you know there's a legal definition of what it means to be a friend? It was based on this question, are your friends on Facebook actually your friend? Have you ever wondered that? <laughs> According to an appeals court, legally, Facebook friends are not necessarily your friends. So the court dove into this question because of a judge who may have been required to recuse herself from a case because an attorney involved in that case was friends with the judge on Facebook. However, 
The court ruled that a recusal was not necessary because they said Facebook friends are not really friends. <laughs> How many are thankful for true friends? Yeah. Uh, you may have hundreds if not thousands of Facebook friends, but those are not necessarily your true friends, are they? And this word that the friends came out to meet us is the word for coming to meet a general or a king or a conqueror. And they go out to meet Paul as one of God's generals, kings, conquerors. And isn't that ironic? How's he arriving there? As a prisoner. Yet they come out to meet him as if they're meeting. This is one of God's conquerors, one of his generals. And the body of Christ is there to encourage him at this time. And you have a family here called the church, don't you? And it's so blessed as we were singing this morning and just kind of looking out and, and uh, just seeing the kids worship and you guys worship. And it's just such a joy, isn't it, to know that we come together as the body of Christ, brothers and sisters, the family of God. And every time someone makes a sacrifice to call you, you're encouraged. And we looked at this in Sunday school, and Pastor Pat did a, a marvelous job of connecting Hebrews 10 and that we're to meet all, uh, and all the more together as we see, see the day drawing near, that we may encourage one another in our meeting together. And that encouragement, it's not just showing up, is it? It's, uh, it's connecting together in the body of Christ. And we're encouraged. If someone sends a Bible verse to you or prays for you, you realize that you have a friend, don't you? And especially in times of adversity. These are real friends, not social media friends, but real friends who are going to be there for you. Paul had these people that came out, they heard about him coming, and they wanted to meet with him. We'll pick it back up here in verse 16. It says, when Paul came to Rome, or when we came to Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. Verse 17, after three days, he called together local leaders of the Jews, and when they had gathered, he said to them, brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, Yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it's because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing, and you can picture him saying, this chain, because <laughs> he's in chains, right? Remember verse 16, there's a soldier who's guarding him, and he has, he's a prisoner in chains, but Paul is no prisoner, is he? In fact, he's only a prisoner to the will of God, and he knows that. So Paul is living in total freedom in the will of God, even though he's a prisoner uh, by earthly, uh, earthly standards here, but he's a free man in the will of God. Verse 21. And they said to him, we have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are, for with regard to this sect that we know that everywhere it is spoken against. So the sect is really Christianity at this point. It's kind of still considered a sect of Judaism. They're like, well, we want to hear from you what, it, what this Christianity is all about. And it's spoken against. And so there's always been spoken against, hasn't it? And in our day, when we go out and we share the gospel with people, and we, it's still spoken against the gospel or against us. Verse 23. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. If you can imagine that, Paul's really under a, a house arrest at this point. And he's in a house, and we might think, well, that's nice surroundings. And, well, not necessarily. Um, at that time, half of the Roman citizens would have been slave and half free. There may have been two million people in Rome. And even the citizens lived in squalor. And he was in this probably very primitive kind of house, probably a, a cesspool of iniquity around him. And people would come, though, and they would visit him. And he was chained to a soldier. And those soldiers would work in uh, four, six-hour shifts. And so they'd take six hours, and then they'd rotate, and he'd have one soldier with him all the time. And you can just imagine these soldiers guarding Paul and taking rotations. 
and people would be coming into that house, probably a very primitive uh, small home at that point, but coming in and visiting him. And from morning till evening, Paul's explaining and persuading to them about Jesus. And if you can imagine that whole situation, I mean, Paul's 10, 12 hours a day just explaining the scriptures. So we think an hour in church is a long time. Not at all, really. Paul is sharing in, in, uh, for hours upon hours, morning till evening, explaining them uh, about who Jesus is. And in this time, and there's two years that Paul is under this house arrest, and he's writing letters of the Bible, isn't he? Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, uh, writing these scriptures and meeting with people and sharing with, about Jesus with people. And your home really can be a place of ministry, can it? That, and I know a lot of you have opened up your homes. We have our house groups. We're going to be looking to start that again. But the home can be a place of ministry. And Paul is saying, hey, this is where I am, and I'm going to use this for God's glory. And people were coming. And what was the result? Verse 24, some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. So some were convinced. And some disbelieve. And Paul's expounding on the scriptures for 10 to 12 hours a day, right? Not all of them come, came to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And we have to expect that, don't we? Sometimes we can share the gospel with someone, and then we get, um, we get upset or discouraged because they're not responding in the way that we, that we would like for them to. But Jesus prepared us for this, didn't he? With the parable of the sower and the seed. The sower scatters the seeds, which is the word of God. And some fell on the hard ground, and what happened? It was snatched up right away. And only 50% of the soil actually, or the seeds then, fell on the ground that uh, had thorns or rocks. It looked good at first, but then uh, the birds of the air, or the uh, cares of the world, took that away. So there's only 25% of the seeds actually that fell on the good soil that, bo that bear fruit. And even that was 30, 60, and 100 fold. And so we know then that a lot of times the people will not respond. However, there were some that believed. And we can rejoice when we share the gospel and that there are some that are believing. Don't worry about those that aren't receiving yet. Uh, we know that we can rejoice for those. and We want to be faithful sowers of the seed. And Paul then shares in verse, or uh, Luke shares in verse 25, disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear but never understand, and you will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their, ear, their eyes have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. So Paul is quoting Isaiah, and this is from Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah got his message to share the gospel, or to share the, the news there, the message of God. And, he, and God tells Isaiah, the more you speak, what's going to happen? People's hearts are going to get harder. And so his, his definition of a faithful ministry was that the more faithful you are to me, the harder people's hearts are going to get. And that's, that's the ministry of Isaiah. And Jesus said the same thing. He quoted Isaiah with the people who were hard of heart and not receiving him. And now the same is true with Paul. As he's sharing uh, the news, then uh, people's hearts are getting hardened and they're not understanding. It says verse 28, Therefore let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, for they will listen. <laughs> and so uh, we see here then uh, really the message of the gospel is going from Jew to Gentile. As the, Gentile the Jews have rejected it, many of them have. Now it's being taken out to the Gentiles, Paul being an apostle to the Gentiles. Now, some of your Bibles will have verse 29 in it. If it doesn't, I'm going to read it for you. It says, and when they had said these words, the Jews departed, having much dispute among themselves. And the Jews did not like hearing that the Gentiles were going to be brought into the fold as, I, uh, as Paul was sharing the message. Verse 30. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. 
I want you to think about that for a moment. Paul is really sharing the gospel without hindrance, but he's chained to a guard in his home. Now, you might say, well, that's a hindrance in me getting the word of God out to people, or the gospel out to people. I'm chained to my home. We have, and thank you, Tracy, for sharing about the mission report. We can go freely. We can go all around the world if God leads and calls and provides for us to do so. Taking the gospel out. Paul, at this point, is confined to a, a small home, chained to a guard. He says there's no hindrance, without hindrance, in sharing the gospel. And we see here that Paul being chained to a guard, but in reality, the guard is chained to Paul, isn't he? He <laughs> says you cannot escape. You got your six-hour shift, and what's Paul doing? Non-stop talking about Jesus. Have you ever had a friend that said, hey, I'd like to talk to you, but all you want to talk about is Jesus? Well, these guards had no other option. They were chained to Paul, really. Remember I said that Paul wrote four different books, the prison epistles, during those two years. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon. I want to look at Philippians. If you'll flip over to Philippians, and we'll see what Paul had to say to the church that he's writing to at this time. So Philippians chapter 1 12 and 13, and we'll put it up on that screen as well. Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. He said, I want you you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard. These are these soldiers that are chained to Paul, really, and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And so Paul is saying, He's saying, this is, and the church is worried now that our best, our best player is out. If you think of a, a sports team and you lose your star player, and you think, well, now what are we going to do? And Paul's saying, I'm not out of the game. Actually, this is for the advancement of the gospel. You see this as something that's a hindrance, but there's no hindrance here. Why? Because the imperial guard are hearing the message of the gospel that are chained to Paul. And uh, Paul's saying that... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, that there's opportunity advancement now that he's given. And you can just picture, really, this situation. Uh, If you're one of these guards, and some of them uh, were hearing and undoubtedly receiving the message of the gospel, and you can think about, imagine if you were one of these guards chained chained up with Paul there. And you're probably, I mean, you're you're hearing Paul expound on the scriptures and talk about Jesus, and then your, your shift is up. And if God's working in your heart, what are you thinking? You might tell the next guy, hey, just take the night off. Go home with your family. Paul's just about to get to this stuff and make this all make sense to me and, uh, through the Holy Spirit here. And why don't you just take the time off? I want to stay another six hours. Paul's going to be sharing more and more uh, here. You can just imagine what was going on in that, in that house at that time. But go ahead and flip to Philippians 4, 21 and 22. Paul concludes his letter to the church in Philippi. He says, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. Paul had brothers, friends that were there with him. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. So now the household of Caesar is even being impacted with the advancement of the gospel as Paul is chained to the imperial guards in the house, under house arrest in Rome. Let's take a look at Colossians. Paul also wrote Colossians during these two years. Colossians 4, verse 3. The church in Colossae must have been worried about Paul, too, in a way, and being bound in prison, house arrest. It says, at that time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. What is he saying? He says, I may be bound, but the word of God is not. Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, and we see that Paul is, is, is getting the word out. He's writing. People are coming. The Roman guards are being impacted. The prison has become a place of, of ministry for Paul and is sharing a truth that's transforming the world. And we get to the end of the book of Acts with these verses that we just read, and it just simply says here, 
proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance, and then an abrupt ending. And we might think, well, what happened to Paul? What about the trial? You know, what's going to ha- what's the future hold for Paul? Um, and now, why would it end so abruptly like this? Let me give you a few thoughts for your consideration. One is that Luke is really trying to make sure that we don't look at Paul too much because that's not his message. It's not the acts of the apostles. It's the acts of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul is ending it this way because in a sense, it doesn't what does it matter? This book is not Paul's book, it's Jesus' book. And uh, we also know then that uh, that Luke here does give a little bit of insight for us to go on. So how long was he in how, under house arrest for? Two years. Two years. <laughs> two years. <laughs> All right, Chad said two years. Good job, Chad. <laughs> so there's a little clue here, because there's a two-year statutory period that once you got to Rome, that the prosecution could come and make their case against the accused. And Luke's hint that the accusers never showed up because they had two years to get there to make their case, and then the trial would, would commence. But the trial really never began because the accusers must never have arrived. And so that's, that's what's going on a little bit behind the scenes here. It's Clement, who was writing in the 80s, said that, uh, not, the, not the 1980s, but the 80s, the original yeah. 80s, right, <laughs> said that he asserted that Paul went uh, from Rome to Spain, meaning that after the two years were completed, his accusers never came, and he was released there. Eusebius from Caesarea said that Paul was released after two years as well, ancient uh, old church father. So we have enough um, evidence in the scriptures and also from church history that Paul, after these two years, was released. Now, what did he do after the two years were up? We don't know, but he indicated several things in his letters that he wrote during this time. If you remember, he told uh, Philemon, he said that, prepare a guest room for me for when I come. And so he was expecting to be released, and when he was released, undoubtedly he would have went then to Colossae, which is where Philemon was, if you remember from the book of Philemon. Perhaps he went to uh, Crete, the island of Crete, to see Titus, uh, to raise up elders, or went to Ephesus to meet with Timothy one more time. But we do know then that um, in Troas, he was arrested. And at that point, he would have gone to Rome a second time for a second trial. Matt, if we can bring up that map, and we'll show you where Troas is. All right, and maybe we don't have that on that. Okay, well, never mind, Troas. <laughs> but in Troas, uh, he would have been arrested and then stood uh, a second trial, and at this time was when uh, Paul was uh, taken to the Mamertine prison, and we'll show some pics of that. And this is the prison that is very different than when he was under house arrest. So at this point, it's the Mamertine prison, and you can go there today. I don't know, Jama, if you went to... The Mamertine prison. You'll have to go back to Rome then <laughs> to see the Mamertine prison. Everyone sees the Vatican. But this is really, I think, I think, the place to go. And you can see where Paul spent his final days. And this was really a hole in the ground. And that's a hole that they would actually have a rope that they would drop people into. It was cold and dark and filthy. And this is the final prison. And the end of his life is chronicled in 2 Timothy. And go ahead and we'll flip to 2 Timothy, and we'll see how Paul, uh, what he wrote at the end of his life, just before facing his martyrdom. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. It says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Verse 7, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. 
Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me also, but to all who have loved his appearing. Verse 9. And that's it. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll pick it up, verse 11. Go ahead and turn to there, if you will. Verse 11. And we see here that Paul sharing, Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. Tychicus, I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas. And this is where Paul was arrested in Troas and then sent to Rome for the final time. Also the books and above all the parchments. And so what did he leave in Troas? He was arrested, his coat, his books, his parchments, above all, the word of God. And here he has his departures at hand. He knows he's about to die. And what does he want? He wants to be warm because he's in a cold, dark hole in the ground. And he also wants the word of God and in the books that he can write and that he can continue to study. What an example. This may be my favorite Bible verse. <laughs> People ask me that sometimes. All right, verse 14 but Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. And then, but the Lord has stood by me and strengthened me, so that through, uh, through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and the Gentiles might hear it, all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. All right. So just in closing, I want to kind of wrap this up here for you here today. Is that Timothy Keller had shared there's two marks of a friend. And if you think a person is a friend, they should be doing two things. One is that they let you in and they, they don't let you down. Okay. So they let you in. It means that they have to open up their heart to you, that they're vulnerable to you. Remember, Paul was sharing with the with the church, he said that he opened up his heart to them, but they hadn't opened up their hearts to him. And so for a friendship, you have to have both vulnerable, open hearts. You also have to have someone that is not going to let you down. In verse 17 of 2 Timothy there, 2 Timothy 4, it says that the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. So that word to strengthen, it means to nurse or to bind up wounds. And this is really the tenderness of friendship. And what is the one thing that Paul needed at the end of his life? And it's really friendship. With who? With God. And it's not just a belief in God in general, but a friendship with God. And what he says is that at this time, and this is the second imprisonment at 2 Timothy, he's saying then that, that, um, that God was at his side at a time like that, that he was with him. And we look at the first imprisonment. Remember when he was on his way to Rome, who came out to meet him? The friends came out to meet him. But at this point now, in, the, in this hole in the ground, he said, only Luke is with me. And that's incredible, really, for Luke to say, I'm, he's a free man, but he's with him, even in this condition here. But he's at his side by saying, really, that he's all alone, essentially, is what he's saying, that everyone has deserted him. However, he's saying that the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. Now, there are times that you're going to have friends that will be at your side. And there's other times when you'll feel everyone's deserted me. But I still have the Lord here to strengthen me, to nurse me, to bind up my wounds. Do you know God in that way? And that's really looking at being a friend with God. And Jordan didn't know this in picking that song, but what a friend we have in Jesus. Right? All our sins and griefs to bear... Like, Jesus is the faithful friend that we just sang about. And what do friends do? They let you in. And Jesus, what did he do? He stretched out his arm for you. He could not have been more open or vulnerable to you. What do friends also do? They don't let you down. And when Jesus was on the cross, he was forsaken, he was abandoned, he was betrayed. But what did he do? He stayed. Now, the night before Jesus was about to die, Jesus said, I don't just call you servants, but friends. And that's what I want to share with you here today, that Jesus is the ultimate friend. And now Paul's come to a place where he says, everyone has deserted me. And remember, Jesus standing on trial, 
What happened to him when he was on trial? Everyone deserted him, right? Here's the big difference. When Paul got to this point, when he says, everyone's left me, my departure's at hand, what does he say? He says, yet the Lord was at my side, nursing me, binding my wounds. He was there with me. When everyone deserted Jesus, and he's on the cross, and he turns to God, and he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And you can almost hear Jesus say, why aren't you at my side? Paul had the Lord at his side, but Jesus had nobody at his side. Because he was, why? Because he was bearing this, the weight of our sins on him. And he's saying, in a sense, Father, why aren't you giving me strength in my hour of adversity? But he wasn't just dying. He was dying in our place, getting what we deserve. And we turn away from God. What do we deserve? Sin, wrath, hell, death, right? What did God do? He gave us life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And Jesus must go through that time of abandonment on the cross. Why? So that Jesus won't abandon us. Is he your friend? He's a, he's a faithful friend, a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And that means in our imperfect moments, in our times of adversity or despair, in our moments of great need, you have a friend in Jesus. Amen? And we just sang about that. And you might say, well, everyone else has forsaken me. But you will always have the Lord at your side who's the friend that sticks closer than anyone else. And when all have abandoned you, Jesus is with you. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you. However, we also know then that we do want other people in our lives, don't we? And at the end of 2 Timothy, Paul told Timothy, he said, come before winter. Why? Because if you wait till winter, we should have learned in Acts 27, you wait too long to come, and you're apt to be in a shipwreck, Right? But it's saying, come before winter, before it gets cold and you're not able to get here. Paul had a friend in God that was with him when all else had abandoned him, but he still wanted Timothy to come and visit him. And so there's people that you have in your life that need you. And don't overlook that important act of friendship. And he's saying, what, do, what does he need from Timothy? Well, he needed a coat, right? The parchments and the books. But mostly, he probably needed Timothy. He's saying, I need a friend in my time of need here. In prosperity, our friends know us, but in adversity, we know our friends. And who is it that God's calling you to be a friend to today? And, who, and how is it that God wants you to grow in a friendship with him? Amen? We're going to have our worship team. If you guys would come forward, and we're going to sing. And do you know Jesus as a friend? He's not just, not, just that he's, not just that he's with us in a way that he's omnipresent, that he's everywhere, but that you really know him and that you experience his presence in your life. So, Father, as we are about to sing and, and to just uh, praise you, and uh, Lord, it's been a good day today, uh, a day that you've made, a day that we can celebrate your goodness, Lord, your love uh, for us, and Lord, your invitation that we would be your, not just your servants, but your friends. And we know, Lord, that uh, we're to be walking with you. Your word says that uh, how can two come into, a, uh, how can two walk together unless they have agreement? So, Lord, we pray that we would come in agreement with you, Lord, in your will and your plan for our lives. Lord, we pray that we would experience not just an intellectual knowledge of your presence in our lives, but a deep abiding friendship. As we abide with you, Lord, we know that that you are with us, and that we can know you in a personal way. And I pray that we would press in even deeper. And we thank you even for the times of adversity where we can even have a greater understanding and awareness of your presence and your friendship in our lives. But Lord, we do pray for uh, friendships here today. We pray that they would be strengthened. Lord, that we would encourage one another in our times together here in church each Sunday but also during the week. And Lord, when you put it on our hearts to reach out and to call and to pray and to write and to, and to serve one another in our, in our fellowship here, Lord, we pray that we'd be faithful to do that and that we'd be faithful friends and that we would not delay and put it off. As Paul shared, to come before winter, he's saying, do it now, Lord, because we do not know uh, when it will be, um, when we'll be out of time. So we just pray, Lord, that we would be faithful to respond Lord, to your word, we thank you for opportunities that you will provide this week and in the weeks ahead. 
And Lord, we thank you that you are the faithful friend that's with us all the way. We pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.
expansion of love and mercy and forgiveness by the power of the cross. Let us each go in peace and love and humility. Praise your name, Lord. Amen. You're dismissed. If you are planning to stay for our meeting here, you can just stretch and walk around and use the restroom if you need to. Then we're going to meet right back here in just about five minutes. And we'll, we'll begin our, our meeting and our congregation meeting. Uh, otherwise, you're dismissed. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.